as trivial sounding an issue as this may be to bring up first, I can't help it. I notice in your book you have an article about spoilers, and my own opinion about spoilers has long been that if a film is actually spoiled by revealing plot details, what you have is a bad film. Can I take it you agree with that? I don't know if I would necessarily. I think in, a, in some cases, I kind of hate to be prescriptive, you know? There, there might be some film that might come along that could prove us wrong. You know, it's like... <laughs> uh, so I kind of hate to, to make, up, make up rules about films that I haven't seen yet, if you follow me. Um, right. I, th- I think that as a rule... Yeah, I mean, I, I tend to... I think films should be something that we should be able to re-see. And of course... I understand part of the idea about spoilers, but I also think that there's a kind of uh, exaggerated importance that people give to things like this, which tends to rule out other possible ways of enjoying films. You're listening to the Marketplace of Ideas. My name is Colin Marshall. I'm talking to Jonathan Rosenbaum, who was the principal film critic at the Chicago Reader from 1987 to 2008. He's the author of books on film like Placing Movies, The Practice of Film Criticism, and Movie Wars, How Hollywood and the Media Limit What Films You See. He's also the author of books on films like Jim Jarmusch's Dead Man, which I find to be his best film, and directors like Abbas Kiarostami and Orson Welles. His new book is Goodbye Cinema, Hello Cinephilia, Film Culture in Transition. One of the pieces in the book is, of course, on spoilers, as I just mentioned. And, you know, the the idea that the idea that plot is the most important thing about film has it seems to have taken hold in in I don't know if we can call it the mainstream, but I seem to notice a breakdown in, in the critics that I read. Some care very much about plot. Some seem to put it as as simply one element among equals, or even even a lesser element in cinema because cinema is about so much other than plot. I mean, can I say that's your perspective, where plot is is less important than other elements? Well, I think, very, yes, I think it usually is. I think it's part of the idea of, I think if it's, if it's a broader difference of opinion, is whether film is, like, disposable, whether, in other words, you're supposed to see a film only once and never experience it again and even not even think about it again or whether it's something you go back to and see in different ways and different aspects. And, of course, the whole idea of spoilers is only about for the first time you see a film, right? It doesn't make any, <laughs> yes. It's not relevant if you're seeing it again and you already know certain twists and so on. So I think part of the added difference in attitude is about that. Um, not only, but I think that has something to do with it, the idea that film is disposed to be disposable, which... I think at least if they're important films, they're not, you know. How do you feel about the about that notion that the second time you see a film is really the first time because you're not preoccupied with following a story? Well, it's partly that, but I think I think part of the other distinction is that for me as a critic, it was very if there was any film that if I often tried to see films more than once, not every time, but but many times because you know, you have we have so we we bring so many preconceptions about films to them that it was it almost becomes necessary for a critic to see them twice because the first time is just to get rid of your preconceptions. Plot has an awful lot to do with some of those preconceptions, but they're not the only ones. I mean, there's also you know what you read about in terms of the ads and in the media and all. There's a whole image that you have of the film before you see it, which sometimes is not sometimes is anything but helpful. Sometimes it gets in the way of appreciating it. It all depends. It's, and I think one of the things that we're subject to, unfortunately, is that what films we see often is determined by which films people want to feel comfortable making up ads for. And it's the ads that sometimes we're responding to more than the films themselves, because the campaigns kind of tell us how to watch the films often. So it's easy to see why, as a critic... You've got to get rid of preconceptions. You've got to minimize their effects on your assessment of a film. But that seems to me to be equally the job of the responsible cinephile, you know, a non-professional viewer. They would seem to be to have the same responsibility of getting rid of their preconceptions, do they not? 
Uh, yes, at least I would think so, and because it, and I and I try to make what my preconceptions are sometimes part of what I'm writing about, because I think that that's part of the experience of a film too. I mean, it's you know there are several stages we go through often. Sometimes it's a question of just figuring out what the film isn't before we can figure out what it is. Of course, the transitions are. A big element of this book. I mean, film culture and transition is the subtitle, and I want to talk about that. But you've you've mentioned we've talked about even so far the difference between watching as a critic and watching as a simply responsible viewer. And I want to know you you've said in other interviews that a good thing, a specifically good thing about not being a critic at the reader anymore is that you don't have to watch films simply because they have come out. You can choose the films you watch, and I want to know. What what else is different about the way you view films, if anything, as as someone who is a known critic versus someone who is a known critic who also has to turn out a certain number of reviews for a paper? I don't know that there's a lot of difference because, I mean, I think it, I still write about film, sometimes even occasionally new films, and it's just that not, not so much for the reader anymore. So I think it, in a lot of ways, I think... I don't know. I don't like to think that. I don't think that there's a major way in the way I sort of sit down to watch something, except that I'm more likely to watch things nowadays by choice a lot of the time at home, and also for reasons of convenience, because I'm, I'm actually spending much of my time this year in Richmond, Virginia, teaching at Virginia Commonwealth University, and I'm not walking distance to any uh, commercial movie theaters, and I don't miss not going to them, frankly. I think I, I have other ways of seeing the films, and uh, one of the advantages, I would say, about watching films on DVD, although there are obviously drawbacks, too, is that if you're writing about it, you can stop, and if you miss a line of dialogue, you can go back and hear it again or see a shot again, something that you particularly like or want to get a closer take on. And so that option is um, does make it a different experience. And I think uh, I've tended to gravitate towards that for various reasons since I stopped being a regular weekly reviewer. Although even when I was a weekly reviewer, I was previewing films sometimes on DVD, screeners. Now, it's fascinating that you'd say you do, you don't miss going to the theater, because, of course, now this will be, this will be a certain, a certain, um, it's maybe embarrassing for me to say, but, you know, cinephiles of my own generation, we we weren't around in the 60s, for example, and we, we romanticize uh, the cinephilia of that time because we think about, oh, is, is seeing all of the French New Wave films in the in the theater, being able to see revivals of certain films, and, you know, we, we think this is all very delightful to, to imagine having having existed at one time, but... I think this is something we need to be reminded of as well, because in your book you talk about the advantages of today. But, I mean, what can you tell cinephiles who did not live through the 60s through the 70s about the time before VHS, before DVD, when, when the theatrical experience was all? Well, one thing that I think people tend to uh, sometimes forget about that period um, is that a lot of the films that are valued so highly now were not films that played very long at theaters. They often flopped. They were attacked by the critics. They were not, in other words, it wasn't like they were storming the theaters to see Godard films. The Godard <laughs> films were, had very, as I say, very short runs and were generally attacked by most of the critics. So I, in one way I feel different, even though I, I love his work, and in fact he was responsible for me getting my job at the Reader, Dave Kerr. He's coming out with a new book in the spring, which I can recommend to everyone, about his pieces in the a book of his pieces in the Chicago Reader, and it's called What Movies Mattered. Now, what that implies, that title, <laughs> is that movies mattered back then, and today they don't. And I think it all depends on who you're talking about. I know plenty of cinephiles today for whom movies matter as much as they did back then. It's just that the styles of movie going are quite different. And I also have to say, like I've seen films in theaters, I grew up in a family of exhibitors. Yes. So I actually was seen... For, so that aspect of film going was, of course, extremely important to me when I was a child. But that kind of film going doesn't exist anymore anyway, because film going then was the kind of like major medium of people in the United States. And, you know, then TV came in, then the internet, of course, and that superseded it, uh, TV in a lot of ways. So it's, it's TV... I mean, movie going now... <laughs> 
when people go to theaters is kind of tailored for, you know, like teenage boys largely. <laughs> it's not for everybody. And and when I go to commercial theaters, I'm kind of a, appalled often at the kind of insulting ways the audience is treated, all the stuff, the ads they have to sit through, all the ways that they're really not, um, it's not, it's not a kind of a, an activity that has a community aspect to it in the way that it used to. And of course, when I'm talking about the community aspect, I'm talking about really in the 50s when I was a kid, not even when I was in the 60s and was in New York and, you know, seeing new wave films to a large extent, because even though there were some communal aspects to that, not nearly as many as there were, of course, when I was growing up in a small town. And yes, of course, you're you're entirely correct about the teenager sort of gearing of the current theater-going experience. But also, when I think of the communal aspect, I'll give you a, a relevant example. In fact, tonight, uh, at the end of this day, I'll be going to Los Angeles to the L.A. County Museum of Art to to watch Bonnie and Clyde screened at the uh, screen there, screened at the museum. And I've been purposely not watching this movie my whole life because I've wanted to see it in a theater. For I'm glad you're doing that because I think that's a good idea. I've had to, I used to go to various a lot of wonderful uh, revival screenings at the L.A. County Museum when I taught in different periods, both in, um, San Di- in San Diego and in Santa Barbara. Uh, and I agree, it, for things like that, it's very important, particularly for Bonnie and Clive, which has such a kind of visceral impact in seeing it. What's the difference to your mind between a movie that, that you should find a way to see in the theater and a movie that you might as well watch on DVD? Well, part of it, again, has to do with that community aspect. Uh, it's other aspects, too. Like, for example, playtime. It's very important in playtime because of the, the fact that it's a lar- it was a film shot in, you know, six, I think 65 millimeter, and that you're, you really, if the images are bigger than you are, you're, what you're looking at is, you know, it's like you have a choice of what to look at on yeah. the screen. If it's on a small TV or an iPhone or something, <laughs> the whole point of it is lost. <gasps> Uh, playtime on an iPhone. I don't even want to think about that. I was watching Playtime last month on DVD. And in fact, the whole time, all I was thinking was, I should be seeing this in a theater. This isn't, I can't watch this like that. Yet I did because it's, you know, it's so enjoyable. But the whole time I can also see it. Of course, a lot depends on the size of the screen and the, you know, how, how well, you know, like the definition of the image. And stuff. So there are other factors that come into it. But it is very much planned for me, you know, like a crowd of people seeing another crowd of people. That was the whole idea of the filmmaking. So if you're seeing it alone at home, it's not quite the same situation, unless you're projecting yourself imaginatively into the situation of being, you know, like as if you were seeing it with a group of other people. One of the elements of the film culture and transition you discuss in the book especially is the way, I was going to say the way the crowd has moved on to the internet, but it's really more that the conversation has moved onto the internet. It's it's not so much the it's not so much the crowd you see a movie with is now online, but the people that you would have gathered at the coffee shop with perhaps afterward are on the internet now. Is that is that a decent way of framing that to your mind? That I think so. Yes, I think it's very important because and it's actually because it's one of the ways in which one can say that there is an intensity in cinephilia and cinephilia activity now that didn't exist before because when I was discovering, you know, new wave films in the 60s, the common experience most people had was you would see a film and it would it would hit you very hard, but then maybe three weeks later you would meet somebody else who saw the movie. And then three weeks after that you would meet still another person. And so it would be a very sort of a slow way socially that you would relate to other people about it. Mm. It was still kind of like a lonely experience. Whereas now, because there's so much discussion that goes on before and after you see the films, it's, it, you know, and also you can find people who, who've seen the films and have similar interests right away. You don't have to wait weeks or months or years. You know, it's the same thing with when you publish a book and you, in fact, that happens even more when I've published books. Sometimes, you know, it used to be that you'd have to wait a few years before you'd <laughs> run into somebody who read your book, you know. Whereas I think the Internet changes that and kind of speeds things up which I think is really good. Also, this is a very important aspect for me, and it's, it's changed my life, is how international it is. I mean, I'm really proud to say that the people who read my website come from something like 141 different countries. And, uh, so, and the point is, there's a real community of cinephiles now, but you don't have to be 
based in the same place as somebody else in order to be feel like you're part of that community. I feel like I'm more part of that community than I feel part of any or ever felt part of any you know, film-going community in Chicago, for example, I have to say, because I think it's a much more focused community in terms of what people are interested in and the discussions that go on in, in chat groups and Facebook and, you know, in different situations. It doesn't surprise me that you have taken to the Internet as much as you have, because thinking of the, the work of yours that I've read, you know, I've come to think of you as the most international critic that I, that I have read in terms of you know, the, the most, you seem to appreciate a wider international variety of films and champion a wider interna- international variety. And is it, is it accurate for me to say this internationalism, the internationalism you show in the films you watch and the films you have selected as essential, is the same internationalism that you appreciate in the conversation? I mean, do, do you want as much, as much internationalism in all aspects of film, be it the films themselves or the conversation, as you can get? Well, I do think that I, I, one thing that, of course, this is a reflection of is that I spent eight years in Europe yes. when, when, for very formative years when I lived in Paris and then in London. And, and I would even say that my appreciation of American cinema, which I have to say, even though I'm very much into you know, various national cinemas, I'm actually, if I had to pick one national cinema that was the greatest and you know, I'm more involved in than any of the others, it would definitely be the American. Mm. But, but on the other hand, I have to say that my appreciation of American cinema came large, to a large extent from the French. It was, the, it was French critics who taught me how to appreciate Alfred Hitchcock and Howard Hawks and Nicholas Ray and Samuel Fuller and lots of people. I mean, you know, some, there were some American people, you know, like disciples, like Andrew Sarris, but even he was getting a lot of his inspiration from the French. So I think that's important, too, and I think it happens more than just in film. In literature, you know, uh, William Faulkner was appreciated in France to a greater extent before he was really appreciated, uh, and, or still is appreciated more in France in some ways than in the United States. So I think that has something to do with it, too. And it also, I think it has an awful lot to do with the idea, in, in America, there's a big difference between people who've ever left the country, even briefly, and just what it does to your perspective to be able to see America from the way that the rest of the world sees America. And also to feel like you're part of that world, too. Because it seems to me that it's very important whether people regard themselves as just a citizen of America or whether they're really a citizen of the world. And and therefore, how much they relate to other people who are in that world, you know, international community. And the, the funny thing is, is that America in some ways is more isolated now than it was during the Cold War from other countries. And yet... Because of the internet, the possibilities of being in touch with people all over the world are enormously greater than they were. Enormously. And so I feel there's a lot of very, what's very gratifying to me is I feel like I'm getting news about what's happening elsewhere in the world from some of the people I correspond with. And that there's a real sense of, um, and not just interactivity, but getting a sense of what's going on that you couldn't get necessarily get from news. I mean, including, for example, students who are involved in the demonstrations in Iran, for example, dissidents. That's just one example among many. But, um, but I do think that it's, it's, there is a very exciting uh, community that, and of, of people with common interests, and I feel consequently when something goes on within this world, you know, the news travels very, very fast now, whereas it used to take months or years to learn things. Now you learn about them immediately. Do you believe that... An American gains a more honest, shall we say, appreciation not just of American film, but of American culture and of America in general by stepping outside of it. Well, I think sure. I think that's true of any of any kind of uh, let's say regional position. I think it's very important to be both inside and outside because you can see more perspectives. And it's you know it's very funny because I mean. When I lived in Paris for five years, I became very much aware of how the French people experienced Americans who came over on vacations there and acted a certain way and expected a certain things and even expected the French people to be a certain way, which they weren't always. <laughs> you know, it's very funny, some of the attitudes. Like, you know, all this stuff about the French and Jerry Lewis. You know, the French have been actually... Oh, it was, about, I would say, 10 or 15 years ago, there was an interview with me in a French magazine in which 
they actually made a point of how weird and eccentric I was to say that I actually preferred Jerry Lewis to Woody Allen. <laughs> Woody Allen is much bigger in France than Jerry Lewis, and he's not, you know, it's not like, uh, if Jerry Lewis himself has said that there are 20 or 30 countries in the world where he's much bigger than he is in France. And in fact, if you really want to get down to it, he never would have been heard of in France if he hadn't been so much bigger in the United States. I mean, he was making two films a year in the 50s, at least. And that was because he was huge in the United States, and people are in denial about this, you know? <laughs> but, that's, but, but all this stuff about the French and Jerry Lewis is based on a, not only a misperception, but a refusal to even look at the facts. Because, I mean, it doesn't correspond to the reality today, and it, it never corresponded that precisely, except for, you know, a few odd French intellectuals around about Jerry Lewis, you know, back in the 50s. Is the only kind of like basis in reality that that had. So anyway, I think that sure. I, but I also think it's kind of like we're living in a very small community now in the world. And if we don't, if we're not aware of our neighbors, you know, it it catches up with us. I mean, I think there's going to be a certain time in the future when people, are, when other countries are going to be a little tired of you know like uh, America owing this much money and spending more money than they do, <laughs> and so on, and, you know, want to get paid back. I think it's like they've been very patient with America, because America has furnished, I mean, it's given an awful lot to the world. There's no question about it. But I also think what's becoming more and more evident is the two main contributions are weapons and entertainment. It's like <laughs> weapons and movies. And any cinephile coming up now or learning about the history of, of cinema in the 20th century learns that France was such a force is even even in even in american cinephile circles in the mid century and the with there with that comes the surprise that nowadays if you're watching films in america you have to seek out france france doesn't necessarily come to you in the form of the new wave in the form of godard in the form of the idea that france is the french filmmakers are are masters of the form what happened well i think it's a lot of different things i mean one thing that i have to say is is that french cinephilia while well, it's very intense france french culture is in some ways it's very paradoxical in its own way kind of insular because most french film critics i know don't read that much of you know of critics from other cultures mm. i mean they do, a few of them do, and you know, it's like there's some things that get translated, but there's a large extent they just read other French critics, you know, so that there's a kind of way in which, um, I think that there are changes in the culture, and again, I was saying that paradoxically, during the Cold War, America was more open to outside influences, and not, to, I don't mean just from Russia, but from generally, I think there's a kind of way in which I mean, I don't know. There are ways in which it's possible to be more up with what's going on in France through the Internet than one could be before. But there's the language barrier also. And that's, of course, very significant. And it was, it's always been a problem for me because even though I've translated, even translated a book into from French into English, <laughs> I've never been that fluent. I'm, I'm, I, it's like a disability. I've really never been uh, I'm much better at reading than speaking. And it's, I got very self-conscious about my bad accent and Given the unprecedentedly easy access we all have to the cinema of other countries, what what are the countries that are really exciting you right now as far as the cinema they're producing? Well, I don't. I'm not in a position to tell you that because I'm not keeping up with. I tend by choice. I tend to tend to see older films rather than newer ones. Also, mm. if there's something new that's going on in a different country, you know, what the, the kind of way in which I hear about it is at first it goes to Cannes. And if it makes a hit at con, it might get to America a year or a year and a half after that. So unless I'm sort of like, and I don't go to con, I mean, nobody sends me there. So, uh, or that hasn't happened since I was on the New York Film Festival Committee, and that was in the 90s, so it's been some time. I don't have any easy way of finding this out. I would say that, um, and I don't, and I also think that there's a way in which, to a large extent, it's hard to sort of like always think of it in terms of countries because sometimes I just think of it in terms of individuals. It does seem like the independent video scene in China is very rich now. Mm. That's something, but I wish I knew more about it. I just know about that mainly from hearsay. Uh, that's one thing that I've heard about. Heard about. It's unfortunate that after a very exciting period in Iranian cinema, 
because of the censorship and the uh, repressive society, it's really impossible to make films, you know, that are interesting that would in Iran that would be shown in Iran. Uh, you know, I don't know if people don't know, maybe know, even know this, but I don't think Kuristami has made a film that is shown commercially in Iran uh, since, oh, for 15 years or really? something like that. It's been a long time. Yeah, his films still get, get banned there. So it's like, uh, and in fact, what's one reason why his last film was made in Italy. I think he's having to reconfigure himself as an international filmmaker if he's going to make films at all, because I think he has a chance of continuing as he has been doing, even making films in Italy. At least it seems like, given what's happened to Jaffer Panahi, who's one of the very best, he's not going to, he's not being allowed to make films. So, so I think it's, you know, I think things do change, but I I'm not, I don't feel like, the only way I feel like I, I hear any, you know, like I'm, I keep up with things is just through the internet, but not in terms of always, sometimes things that I can see, because sometimes people send me DVDs and things like this. So I do get to see glimpses of things that way. But um, I think it's sometimes individual things that are exciting that come from, uh, you know, other countries. It doesn't necessarily mean a national movement, but I mean, there was a film that was a kind of a history of Helsinki and also of Finnish cinema and, you know, various related things. That was a friend of mine, Peter von Bach, brought out a few years called Helsinki Forever. That was a film I was very excited by. But I mean, you know, there's, I'm very excited by the films of a friend of mine who's a neighbor of mine in Chicago, Peter Thompson, and almost nobody has seen his films because they're very slow in getting out. I think he's shown at one festival so far in California. Uh, I wrote an article about his films in Film Quarterly, but they haven't shown, you know, the films have not shown. They're not available on DVD. They're not, you know, eventually it might, they might become, but I think people tend to depend too much on, you know, by necessity on, you know, things like advertising and advertising budgets when we talk about the best films of a given year, we're really talking about commercial cinema because we're talking about films like Peter Thompson's films. I mean, he did some, he, he, the film, his last, you know, major film was done last year, but nobody's seen it yet. So maybe it belongs to this year or the year before. <laughs> you know, it's, you can't date the things so quite because the whole way time works when it comes to independent and experimental film is different. It's not, you can't sort of chart it and say this year the same film is going to go out to all these places the way a commercial film does. So I, I think it's really hard, to, even from that point of view, to talk about national cinemas, because sometimes just to see individual things in America that are important are not easy. I mean, I would say the most, one of the most exciting films I've seen in the past year, which I saw at the Viennale in Vienna, is a film made by actually two Americans, although one of them is actually lives in France and has become an expatriate, uh, named Noel Birch, and it's called The Forbidden Space. It hasn't, sh not only is it not shown anywhere in the United States, it hasn't even been scheduled to be shown anywhere yet. Oh. And once it does, then I can write about it. You see, it's sometimes <laughs> a kind of um, vicious circle that I, you know, for me to write about it somewhere on the Internet, I could write about it anyway when nobody can see it, but it makes more sense to write about it when people can see it. So I'm waiting on it for that for that to happen so that I can write about it. If you've just tuned in, this is the Marketplace of Ideas, and I'm Colin Marshall. My guest is film critic Jonathan Rosenbaum, author most recently of Goodbye Cinema, Hello Cinephilia, Film Culture in Transition. If when this conversation is over, you'd like to hear it again, visit colinmarshallradio.com where you'll find the complete Marketplace of Ideas interview archive. Or, if you prefer iTunes, open up iTunes, search in the iTunes store for the Marketplace of Ideas, and you'll find our complete archive there as well in the podcast directory, all, of course, completely free at either location. Do you have any feedback, positive, negative, neutral, or otherwise, or guest suggestions, or absolutely anything? Send that along to Colin, C-O-L-I-N, at ColinMarshallRadio.com. That is Colin at ColinMarshallRadio.com. And as well, send me an email there if you'd like to be added to the Marketplace of Ideas mailing list, offering weekly updates on current and upcoming Marketplace of Ideas interviews, as well as other related internet interestingness. That's Colin at ColinMarshallRadio.com. Send me whichever email address you'd like to be added to the list. Now back to the conversation with Jonathan Rosenbaum on the Marketplace of Ideas, cultural conversation of the depth you demand. Do you think you, you have the ability, though, to, to write about a little scene movie and 
and by dint of that, help it help push it toward getting seen a little bit more just because the word of Jonathan Rosenbaum has been attached to this movie now and it's going to be better known among people in a position to maybe get it seen? Well, I hope that's what I, you know, I, I try to do and hope to do. Sure, that's, that's part of, the, you know, like the aspiration in a certain way. But I think, as I say, that there's still sometimes a kind of vicious circle because if, if it's not a film that people can get, sometimes for technical or various reasons, people can't get a hold of it. On the other hand, you know, it's a very funny... Somebody like, for example, uh, Pedro Costa, the Portuguese filmmaker, he's somebody who's considered neglected, and, and of course in relation to the mainstream, he is neglected, but Criterion's brought out a box set of his recent work. Uh, he's had retrospectives all over the world at all kinds of places. So, I mean, what used to be called neglected is not necessarily neglected if you sort of like add up all the activity and interest. And it also, if, you're, if your perspective becomes international, like if you look at Kurist, uh, like a Iranian filmmaker Kuristami in an international context, he's not neglected at all. He has so many, so many people who love and worship his films around the world that he can make any kind of films he wants and get some finance as far as what he need, you know wants to do. Um, budgets are not a problem for him at all, and so on. And so it, it, when we talk about neglected, sometimes we're, we're too narrow and just thinking about what we can see. Uh, because America is sometimes in a provincial position relative to parts of this culture. That does, just because it's neglected here doesn't mean it's neglected somewhere else. And that's where I think it becomes complicated when one thinks <laughs> like about when movies mattered, because that has bearing not just on how we judge a period, but how we judge, a, you know, like where something is being appreciated. That implies movies mattered, used to matter everywhere in the world, and now they matter. They don't, or they used to matter some in America, and now they don't. It's, we have to sort of think about where we're coming from in all of this, I think, before we kind of like uh, can evaluate these things. And I think the part of the problem is that there's been a tendency in America to equate America with the world, and America is not the world. Sometimes it's the world, in some ways it is, but some ways it isn't. I'm thinking about that title again, When Movies Mattered, and... The... Well, it's a, and, and I, 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 have to, I hasten to add that this is a wonderful book by the same publisher, by the way, as, uh, as my book, uh, University of Chicago Press. And it's going to be coming out, I think, in April. So I, I urge you, because I do think it's, uh, Dave, Dave is certainly one of the very best American critics we've ever had, I think. And there's a, there's a lot of major stuff that he wrote in for the Chicago Leader that has never been available even online. In fact, almost none of it was ever available online. So it's all stuff that we, you know, people can read now for the first time. On your recommendation, I'm I'm going to invite him on the show then. Oh, I think you should. I think that would be great. And you know, he has a wonderful column every week now in the New York Times on DVDs, which, as he puts it, is really a a column on film history that's disguised as a column on DVDs. <laughs> No, it's. I, I think about the sentiment though that 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 phrase when movies mattered raises in my mind, and it, it does it does it does spark a little bit of a, a worry that I've had in my mind recently about about the way that that as your the title of your book says, uh, cinema has become cinephilia in a sense because I worry that I worry that cinema is or might be getting left to the cinephiles, meaning that it's now it's now a form for people who are into that form, if you know what I mean. Like I do think back and maybe it's maybe this is just an imagining, but it seems to me that in the sixties, people who were non cinephiles would see sometimes they would be able to see a French New Wave film, for example. But now it seems like a lot of a lot of film gets it's only easier seen. to see them if people are focused. You see, I think the difference is is that People have now defined something called niche markets, mm. and I think niche markets have always existed there, but they haven't always been acknowledged. So, and I think niche markets are important. I don't think they're bad. In fact, if we didn't have niche markets, we wouldn't have the French New Wave. I mm. mean, what is the French New Wave or Italian New Realism? But a small group of friends who hung out together and you know wound up, you know, brainstorming ideas together and so on. And and in a sense, that's all. You know, in terms of these things of becoming like special interests, they were they were not. You know, even if they got on, you know, like uh, I don't know, Roman Polanski's first film is you know was represented on the cover of How My Time magazine once. Okay, but I think generally, even in the sixties, 
Godard was not a mainstream taste. He wasn't at all. Oh. It was just that there were ideas that were be exciting about because they were influencing, you know, the movies that did get around a lot, which were the Hollywood films. Uh, but even I think that there are other factors too that are important. You have to remember that there were independent theaters and over a thousand of them at one time in the United States. And people, when they were, they were, there were more things being offered because we had independent theaters. And we had laws protecting independent theaters until Reagan came into office and stopped, you know, and the antitrust laws stopped being enforced. And they haven't been. So now we don't have so many independent theaters anymore. And so consequently, we don't have as many independent films showing up. Right. These are they're very specific business reasons why these things happen, and people often neglect that. It's not about, you know, the audience taste. It's about the taste of the people who are running the business, which is quite different. Do you think, and this is just a hope that I have, but do you think as, as screening films, as running theaters becomes a less profitable business, the, the conglomerates might say, forget about it, and the independents will have an opportunity again? Well, if they, if they have theaters, you see, one of the things that you could do that can happen, but it hasn't happened as nearly enough, is cine clubs, which are, see, I think you could have a great thing. This is happening in some places in the world, but people don't talk about it much. Is there's, there's a series, a whole network of cine clubs in northern Argentina, believe it or not, mm. which show the most incredibly you know, you could say difficult, challenging films every week, and they have a membership of oh, 850, 900 people. And I attended a kind of like uh, a special weekend event there last summer, and it's amazing how sophisticated they are and everything. I mean, they go to see movies that could not even have runs in New York because they're considered too difficult, for instance. I mean, you know, and this is like 850 people in, <laughs> in you know, in the boondocks of Argentina. Yes. Now, it seems to me what you could have is you could have DVDs circulating, and they show DVDs mainly, right, around the world, and like with music groups playing in clubs, you could sell the DVD after you show it, and you could finance the DVDs being released that way. In, in other words, there's nothing to prevent all these cine clubs from doing the same kind of things in the United States, and some do, it's just that we don't always hear about them. We're so used to just sort of like depending on the media. I mean, I actually am happy to say that I have a that I've helped to form a small cine club at uh, in Richmond, Virginia, where I've been teaching, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. We meet once a week and uh, have all sorts of unusual things, and it's and there's some very loyal people who come every week. You mentioned the cine clubs watching films considered difficult. Films may be considered too difficult for a New York run, and. I think back to your list of a thousand essential films or the alternative top 100 that you wrote on which I see so many favorite films and on which I see so many films that I have re- I have read people write about or heard people talk about as being difficult as being sort of as 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 them being afraid of these films because of their supposed difficulty and I wonder how do you how do you interpret how do you think about the concept of the the difficult film are they literally difficult to watch, or does that mean something else? Well, I think that sometimes maybe rather than difficult, challenging might be a better term. Mm. Because what the, there, I think it seems to me that films that are innovative are films that change our viewing habits. And obviously to be changed in one's viewing habits, this creates some difficulty because one has to get used to something new. And so one has to be used to be prepared to kind of like in some ways to be challenged. I mean, Pedro Costa is a good example of this. But if one adds up the number of people, the one thing I think that has changed in, in the taste among the new cinephilia, if we can call it that, is that there are, I know a lot of very young cinephiles who are looking for really difficult films, which was never the case before. I mean, just think of the different reputation of somebody like Bresson today. Bresson, when I was first getting involved in film in the 60s, was considered a joke, even among serious cinephiles. Huh. He was considered so extreme and, uh, you know, Beyond the Pale, and he, you know, when it, around the time he died, there was a retrospective that played all over the world that was so successful that they would bring it back, you know, like for repeat, repeat sessions, you know, and things like this. So it's like he's become much more acceptable now than he was, you know, back in the 60s, the, the supposed golden age, you know. Bresson was too difficult back then, and he's not now. So it seems to me that these things are changing all the time, and they're based on 
Well, they're based on a lot of different things, obviously. But it, I, I think that uh, the fact that people are looking out or even wanting to see difficult films now in some quarters is very encouraging. And, it's, and it, it also shows that we, we tend to have an oversimplified view of it, you know, that people were more sophisticated supposedly back in the 60s than now. I don't think that's true. I think it depends on who you're looking for. And also, you know, how much people are willing to go on out on their own in terms of initiative. And that was true in the 60s, too. You know, just sort of like what sense you're following and what things you're pursuing. In this conversation, a few times we've mentioned the Iranian filmmaker Abbas Kirastami. He comes up a few times in your book as well. And in on this show, on so many of the conversations about film that I've had on this show, he's come up a lot. He's the most brought up filmmaker on this program. And he's often called difficult by some viewers. I personally think that he's he's not difficult at all because he has sort of a primal appeal to me, just the texture of his movies draw me in. How, what are your... I feel the same way, I feel the same way actually, oh. uh, to a large extent. Uh, although th- there are times when, you know, in other words, what he's doing can be a little confusing or off-putting because, it's, because he's, he's constantly trying new things. There are many. But, so, but I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to ask, what, what, is, what does his work mean to you? Well, it means a lot of different things. I mean, um, I co-authored a book with uh, one of my dearest friends, an Iranian woman who lives in Chicago, named Rana Said Vafa. Uh, I know Kurastami personally a bit and like him very much. I mean, I think there are different ways to view him. I mean, when Mernaz and I were writing a book together, she saw him mainly as an Iranian filmmaker, and I saw him mainly as a filmmaker who was telling me things about what was going on in the world, who happened to be Iranian. Mm. But, but the Iranian aspect was, for me, secondary. Uh, but on the other hand, of course, I've learned a lot of things about Iranian culture through Kuristani and through people like Mernaz who taught me things about it. I don't know, and of course, there's some films of his that are much more difficult than others too. I think one has to one has to you know make distinctions there. But I do think that it's it's very interesting that um, that there were very exciting things that were going on in Iranian cinema long before we haven't heard heard about them. And in fact, during the supposed golden age of cinema, the '60s, my, my the greatest Iranian film I've ever seen was made back then, and practically nobody in the United States even knew about its existence. Um, a short, a short film by actually a woman who was some people consider the greatest Iranian poet of the 20th century, Fulk Farzad. And uh, so it's really interesting that even in the supposed golden age, we were, we weren't hearing everything that was going on. You know, it was like we find out about this stuff later sometimes. And I'm trying to think of you know, we've talked about the the number of times Kiarostami comes up in this book, and of course we've mentioned Pedro Costa, who I wanted to ask yeah. about, even if you hadn't brought him up. And I'm thinking of the other animating figures of the pieces in this book. And there is one filmmaker, a French New Wave filmmaker, with whom many are not familiar. And as bad as you say your French pronunciation is, uh, it's probably better than mine. But is his name uh, Luc Moulet? Yes, right. He was somebody who was a, almost like the youngest member of that group of film critics who became filmmakers. You know, he was a, kind of like a disciple of Truffauts and Godards and so on. And he, he was sort of like, he was, came from a very poor family, and he's very working class, but he's also very uh, more left-wing than a lot of his colleagues were in some ways. Although he's a funny combination. He also was... The the the, the, the uh, critic at the Cahiers de Cinema who was first and most enthusiastic about like Samuel Fuller, for example, and and lots of other filmmakers who were not as you know popular now, but weren't always as popular, were more controversial back then. He's very important, and he still is a critic. That's important too, because most of the new wave directors, you know, like once they became directors, they stopped writing criticism. But not Moulet. Moulet still publishes stuff all the time. And still makes films, but the, and the fact that you can get there's a box set that you, that's available of his best features. Unfortunately, in some ways, I just have an article and a short article in the new issue of Cinemascope, this Canadian magazine, which argued that his best films are his shorts. And it's unfortunate that those are available, but not with any French and without any English subtitles. Yeah. So, but the thing is, is that the, the, you know the features are good too, and. He's very, very funny. He's basically a comic director, in which he often stars in the films himself, too. So he's, he's kind of like a Buster Keaton type, in a way, too. Very, uh, 
very uh, poker-faced. And why, why would he not be as well-known outside France as the other French New Wave directors? Well, I think there's different reasons, but I think sometimes this is circumstantial. I mean, you know, if they don't distribute the films, then people don't get to see them. Maybe if they had distributed some of them, it depends, because I think some of them were, were not as, you know, like were more esoteric. And, because he started out with someone who had very little technique and who kind of, you know, brandished his lack of technique, which is a, is a kind of a radical thing to do. I mean, you know, he sort of like came out of the 60s in some ways. Uh, but then he became very adroit, both as a performer and as a director. But by then, it was sort of like he'd already been considered esoteric, so they weren't distributing his films. That would be one way of you know explaining it. Uh, but I think you know the greatest film of Jacques Rivette's has never even been available on DVD in France. I mean, you know, uh, his twelve-hour uh, serial. Uh, one, even though anybody who wants to see it can access it online in a bit torrents from the Pirate Bay you know, this this website, and get it with English title, uh, subtitles. So the point is, these things are available out there if you want to go to the trouble of finding them. And Moulet's films are, you know, as I say, there's a whole box set that's available from Facet's uh, video. So it's not like, that it's, 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 it's not that it's as hard to see his films as it used to be. When I wrote my first article, I had seen, I think, two and a half films over, you know, like 15 years or something. You know, it was like, it was impossible to see anything. Now it's not so hard. And the films are maybe beginning to circulate a little bit, obviously through DVD and other things, and it's, you know, much more. This idea, this notion of, of filmmaker and critic in the same person, of course, Godard has yeah. said that he, he is still a critic, but he, his criticism is in the form of films. And you mentioned that uh, Moulet still writes criticism yeah. and make, makes films. And the whole Cahiers du Cinema crowd, you, know, you mentioned Rivette, my favorite of them, I believe. And I wonder, you know, I find this idea so fascinating, the, the critic and the filmmaker in one person, but I can't tell, is this, is this an idea or a, is a type of person, a type of filmmaker whose time has passed? Or are we seeing more of it in the, with the Internet where there is so much more film oh, well, writing? I think that actually one of the people, even though he doesn't, he doesn't consider himself a critic and he doesn't write criticism, Pedro Costa has incredible... I mean, if you look up at this wonderful online magazine, Rouge, there's a lecture he gave, which is, for me, a major piece of criticism. It transformed my view of certain filmmakers and what he had to say about them. And, and, and you know, I think that, that that's true of... It, sometimes the critics are not ones who necessarily publish criticism, but they talk about things in interviews and other filmmakers that it's the same as criticism. And sometimes the critical insights they have are, are built into the films themselves. Because, I mean, Pedro Pasta, in his own mind, is remaking certain Hollywood films in his own films. And, you know, and it's, it's, to know that is, means that the films themselves are kind of a kind of criticism. And, you know, remaking films by John Ford and Jacques Turner and people like that. Um, my favorite film of his, uh, Casa de Lava, is a re, for him a remake of I Walk With a Zombie. So that thing, his films become criticism too, I think, and, and quite apart from what he has to say about them, which is also interesting. So I think it's you know this is a, something that was kind of started in some ways by the by the French, but I think it's much more widespread. I mean, I haven't read the article yet, but there's a, in the new issue of Cinemascope there's an article by Xi Jiangshan. I don't know if it's criticism, but I do think that there's critical intelligence on the part of major filmmakers, with the exceptions. I mean. Chris Tommy actually is not much of a cinephile, and I wouldn't trust him as a critic, actually, as much as I trust him as a filmmaker. <laughs> but I think, because in other words, when he did something about Chaplin, I think it was very insightful in this series. On, you know, like, But I think that, uh, by and large, the most interesting filmmakers have interesting things to convey about other filmmakers. And, and again, the Internet makes it more possible for these ideas to circulate than it was possible before, I think. So can we say, is, is it right for me to say that when you're watching a movie, you, you are looking for a certain kind of critical intelligence displayed on the part of the filmmaker, or is it just something you like to see? Or is it just something interesting that happens to be present in some filmmakers and some not? I think it's in some. I don't think it's in every filmmaker. And I think it happens, in, and it comes out in different ways, in different degrees. Uh, 
It's interesting that Godard said that he thought that video was something that should be was criticism was something that should be used for criticism, which is why, in a sense, his histoire de cinema is on video; it's not on film, uh, which I think is kind of interesting, and again, which could be seen as his major work of criticism. You know, like uh, that is part of his filmmaking or video making practice. And that's one of the most fascinating pieces you include in the book, Goodbye Cinema, Hello Cinephilia, the new one, that there is the, the article where you talk about Godard's Histoire du Cinema, and uh, it includes it includes exchanges between you and you and him. And this ties in with a way I was thinking about your book and about your pieces in general, which, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like when you get the chance to experiment formally in your criticism, in your writing about film, you do it. Yes, I do like to do that, and I also like to include, when I can, other voices. I think that's important, too. See, one of the things that I feel is the most neglected aspect in criticism is information. And the best way to get information is from other people. I mean, that piece I did with Godard was largely done at Godard's instigation, because, I mean, he brought three episodes of Histoire de Cinema with him in, uh, to Toronto and invited me to watch them. I mean, it was sort of like it would have been almost <laughs> rude of me not to have done an interview with him, and I, right. you know, after having such a rare privilege, you know, to, to see them. And I think he was clever enough to know that this was one way of promoting his series, you know, to like to get me to write about it. <laughs> uh, so it was, yeah, and it was, and in fact, he cooperated by when I was working on it, he sent me on video, uh, you know, a copy of some of the episodes and so on. So it was a... It was a yeah. It was a, you could say it was a piece that we worked on together in a certain way, um, which was very exciting for me, obviously. And I do think it's yes. I think that there, there's a certain kind of way in which this idea of collective activity was very much, of course, important part of Caida Cinema from the beginning. It was a group of friends who were all promoting each other's work. So I think that <laughs> aspect has been a constant in in a way in in a lot of circles in cinema, and and it's. You know, like Pedro Costa has made a wonderful documentary about Jean-Marie Straub and the late Daniel Houillet, and, um, and has supported their work a lot. I think that a lot of filmmakers do support other filmmakers, and we learn about them and, and you know, find out about things from them, from other filmmakers sometimes. And as well as enjoying experimenting with other forms in your criticism, is this... Is this something you want to see in the criticism you read, this formal experimentation? You know, I have the say. I, I certainly can say that I do. You know, it's like novels. Oh, like. yes, very much so. I mean, it's one reason why I'm, 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 I miss reading a lot of her things. I'm very excited by the work of this uh, woman named Leslie Stern, who's done, who did a very interesting book on Scorsese and has written several individual essays. But uh, she used to be based in Australia. Now she teaches in San Diego. She's a really interesting writer who I think and I think that there, are, I think we we need more. I think it would, it would be nice to see more experimentation. I mean, I one reason why it happened with me is that I started out as a fiction writer, and sometimes one who exper- did exper- experimented with form and stuff like this too. So some of that got carried over into my criticism. And of course, I also use the first person a lot, which some people object to. But for me, it's very important to let people know where so- certain ideas are coming from. So I feel, for me, it's a kind of um, way of making it easier for people to judge and to, you know, to work out whatever relation they want to my work. And one thing that Godard once said to me, I always like to repeat because it's so it was so helpful. Is he once said, "I'd like to be used as an airplane, not as an airport," which means people should take me to go where they want to go and then get off. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> they don't. Your their destination doesn't have to be your destination. And so, you know, but, you know, people. I don't expect people to have the same taste that I do. They can use me in, in a variety of ways. They can, what I like could be what they decide to stay away from if they want to use me that way. You know, for instance. We talked about at the top of the interview that you are enjoying watching more older films than newer ones these days. And finally, I do feel I have to ask you this then, which is what what older films are have have come to be particularly exciting to you at this moment. Large group. I mean, I'm 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 just preparing two courses I'm teaching in going to be teaching in Virginia, which are courses I've taught versions of before. One is World Cinema of the 1950s, and the other is World Cinema of the 1960s. There's certain films that I can go back to endlessly and find endlessly important. One is 
Eisenstein, part two of Eisenstein's uh, Ivan the Terrible. That's one I can think of. I've been getting more and more interested in Jacques Turner, partly thanks to Pedro Costa. Uh, I can always go back to the work of Chaplin. He's always fascinating. My real favorite is, in a way, is Carl Dreyer, particularly his last three features, uh, Day of Wrath, Or Dead, and Gertrude, those three. Ati, of course. Uh, Bresson. It's a long list, actually. Uh, and I and and of course I'm leaving things out too. But uh, I I I find that it's um, when we think about it, it's normal. It seems to me to see want to see old films because I mean if we had to sort of restrict our whole appreciation of literature to books that we could buy now in Kmart, just think how impoverished it would be. <laughs> yes. And that's and why should why should in other words why should it be any different with film? I mean except that it's had a, you know we haven't had quite as long a history, but it's. It just seems to me that um, that if you if you look at older films, you have a much bigger choice. You know, it's like a wider choice, and uh, there's more there's more to discover there. Whereas it, whereas if you're just talking about what's current, it's you're basically talking you're basically be subjecting yourself to all this these ad campaigns of you know, and and these are films that are not supposed to be important two weeks from now. They're just supposed to be important momentarily, usually. I've been talking to Jonathan Rosenbaum, film critic, author of A Goodbye Cinema, Hello Cinephilia, Film Culture in Transition. Jonathan, thanks so much for taking the time today. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. If you'd like to learn more about Jonathan Rosenbaum, visit jonathanrosenbaum.com. This has been the Marketplace of Ideas. I've been Colin Marshall. If you'd like to hear this conversation again, visit colinmarshallradio.com or go to the iTunes store and search for the Marketplace of Ideas. At either location, our complete interview archive is completely free for the download. The website of Ben Althaus, the man who makes our theme music, is available at benalthaus.com as well. And if you'd like to be added to the Marketplace of Ideas mailing list and get weekly updates on the show delivered straight to your personal inbox, email me at colin at colinmarshallradio.com. Let me know what address to add to the Marketplace of Ideas weekly mailing list. As always, thank you for listening. We'll catch you next time on the Marketplace of Ideas for more cultural conversation of the depth you demand. God bless the child that could write his own rhymes.